Let me tell you about a country on the other side of the earth, probably about as far away and as different from McKinney, Texas, as you could possibly hope to find, the country of Yemen. So it's just at the end of the Arabian Peninsula, if you're into the whole Middle Eastern geography thing. A few statistics about Yemen. 0.02% of the 33 million people in Yemen are followers of Jesus. The other 99.98% of the people in Yemen are not. Next door to Yemen in Saudi Arabia, conversion from Islam to Christianity is legally punishable by death. And Yemen itself has similar policies. 80% of the adult population in Yemen is addicted to narcotics. 80%, 8-0. There are three doctors for every 10,000 people in Yemen. In Yemen, the law allows girls as young as nine years old to be forced into marriage. In a 2012 global report, Yemen ranked last place in the world for its treatment of women. That's Yemen. Now, there's a couple of reactions we could have to those statistics. We could feel sad. We could feel angry. We might uh, feel superior, right? Because we've got good health care. We have freedom of religion here in America. We value human rights. Yemen is a, a thoroughly Muslim nation, and that's where Islam gets you. Yemen suffers from the very things Yemen values. That's true, but it's also true of us. Apart from Christ, our society, we suffer from the very things we value. For example, in our nation, we love personal autonomy. We love self-assertion, and all the, the mottos of our age reflect that. So we say things like, my body, my choice. I'm going to live my truth. I'm going to love who I want to love. And it's all me, me, me. It's this very self-referential worldview. And this self-centered focus means we isolate ourselves, and it shouldn't be surprising we have one of the highest depression rates in the world. And that's not just Yemen. It's not just America. This is a reality across the globe. People suffer from the very things they choose to value. We are, to put it another way, we are victims of the very things we're guilty of. To use the Bible's word, we are lost. My question for you, brothers and sisters, is this. What what rises up in you when you reflect on that? What emotions come to your heart when you think about how lost and misguided the world is? Is it anger? Is it sadness? Is it self-righteousness? Well, in our passage this morning... We're going to see Jesus consider the state of the world, and we're going to see the emotion that rises in him when he looks at its people, and then we're going to see what he commands us to do about it. So uh, if you've been with us for the last, we've been in Matthew like a year or something, it's been a while, we're only on chapter 9, it's okay. Uh, If you've been with us for the last few weeks uh, in Matthew's gospel or the last few months, you've seen that... Uh, Matthew kind of alternates between big uh, teaching and preaching sections and big healing sections, a big kind of, you know, active hands-on ministry and preaching ministry of Jesus. And today, we're kind of at a hinge point between the two of them. So, uh, and when, when Matthew gets to points like this, what he likes to do when he switches from a preaching to a teaching, or sorry, preaching to a healing, or a healing to a, a, a preaching, he likes to kind of give a state of the union a little uh, summary of what Jesus has been up to, and and it's almost always a hugely significant uh, thing that Jesus says or that goes on in these little key hinge passages. Uh, So we've got four verses uh, today. We're going to break them down into two sections. Verses 35 through 36 show us the world's problem. That's where we'll get a look at Jesus' emotional life. And then verses 37 and 38 show us how Jesus intends to spread the solution. 
So first, what is the problem? That's kind of the first question we need to ask. What is the problem Jesus sees? What does he think when he looks at the world? Uh, Well, Matthew, again, starts kind of his state of the union here in verse 35 with what Jesus has been up to. So look at your Bibles, Matthew 9, 35. It says this, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. So this is the summary. This is what Jesus has been up to in his ministry. Two things. Uh, proclaiming the message of the kingdom, proclaiming the message of the kingdom and manifesting the reality of the kingdom. That's ultimately what he's doing. So when he's proclaiming the message, he's, he's telling the people about the king. He's telling them about the king. This announcement that God's reign is breaking into the world, that all other allegiances to sin and to self and to whatever other thing we might ally ourselves to, those allegiances must bow to this new king because he's supreme, he's over all. And this king brings uh, salvation. Uh, He brings new life as a citizen of his kingdom. Uh, Jared said in a a tech theological quipping a few weeks ago uh, that it matters infinitely who is king over your life. Uh, And he he used the illustration from The Lion King, which I've said before is the best Disney movie ever made. Uh, In The Lion King, right, the pride lands flourish under Mufasa and Simba, and then when Scar is in charge, things don't look so great. It matters infinitely who is king over your life. That's what Jesus is preaching, this new king and life in his kingdom. But he's not just talking. He's also been manifesting the reality of the kingdom. That's what his healings really are. His healings are the inbreaking of the kingship of God into a specific part of the world. So when Jesus returns, the new heavens and new earth, the kingdom comes in full, there won't be any sickness, there won't be any disease, there won't be any like, problems like that or sin. And so when Jesus heals someone, he's, that kingdom is breaking into their life in a visible, 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 physical way. He's manifesting the reality. He's showing this is what it looks like on the last day when God reigns over everything. When he's loved and submitted to his king, sickness is healed, evil is banished, and even death is reversed. That's Jesus' ministry in a nutshell. He's announcing and he's exhibiting the kingdom of God. But that, and so much of what we see, we've seen so far in Matthew, is very external. We see what Jesus is doing, but, but we don't really get an inside look. And in this passage, we finally do. In verse 36, we get this rare inner look at what is in the heart of Jesus. We find out what Jesus sees when he looks at the crowds. Verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus sees the crowds and two words and one image come to his mind. Harassed and helpless, sheep without a shepherd. Now, what does he, what does he mean by that? Uh, we, we kind of have an unfortunate assumption today that uh, being a sheep is a bad thing, right? So sheeple, sheeple is an insult, right? You're, you're, you're sheeple. Like, you're, if you're sheeple, you're just, you know, you can't think for yourself. You know, Susie from accounting, she's just sheeple. She's dumb. She's following what everyone else is saying. Sorry, if you're an accountant, your name's Susie. I did not mean that to you. Um, but we think sheep are dumb, uh, which isn't really true. There, there's a sense in which uh, sheep are followers, but they're not really Dumb. They, they, they just need someone to guide them. They're designed to follow, and they're incredibly vulnerable. They're incredibly vulnerable. It has nothing to protect itself with. No, you know, no, no sharp teeth, no tusks, no talons, no hard exterior shell, literally no defense mechanism to speak of. Uh, they, they can, I guess, run, but that's probably about all they can do. Uh, actually, in pre- preparing for this sermon, this is what sermon preparation looks like. You get an inside look. I was wondering, well, can sheep run? Uh, and I, I Googled it, and there's a YouTube video of a herd of sheep joining a marathon in Germany. It wasn't pretty, okay? Sheep aren't great runners. Now you know. You didn't, uh, you know, it's, you came to church, you know, probably not expecting that, but now you know. Sheep need a shepherd. They need someone to guide them, to protect them. Without that, they wander, they go astray, they get eaten. 
to borrow a description I've already used this morning, they suffer from the very things they are guilty of. Their own nature creates problems for them. The world is not a safe place for sheep. They need a shepherd. And that's, that's what Jesus sees when he sees the crowds. He says they are victims of their own nature. The very things they're guilty of, they're suffering from. That raises an important question that we need to ask. Who are these crowds? Right, when, you, when you read your Bible, you've probably heard us say this 10,000 times, pay attention to the details, right? Pay attention to the setting and you know, where we are, who we're speaking to, everything that's going on. Pay attention to the details because so much of the meaning is just packed in there. Uh, but look at this passage. We don't really get any. Verse 35, it just says, He went throughout all the cities and villages. You want to ask Matthew, like, which ones? And he's like, you know, all, all the cities and the, and the villages, too. Just all of them. We have no idea where we are. And who is Jesus speaking to? Matthew's like, you know, the, the crowds, people, hu- humans. You know, could you be more specific, please? Like, are we talking, are we talking to Pharisees? Are we talking to fishermen? Are we talking to, uh, you know, to Gentiles? Are these Jews? Are they predominantly men? Are they predominantly women? Are they Republicans? Are they Democrats? Are they NASCAR fans? Like, what, who, are we, who are we talking to, J- Jesus? Well, here's what Matthew's doing. He's being deliberately vague about where this is happening. He's being intentionally generic. He is non-contextualizing Jesus' words. Isn't that nice? I'm like, church, pay attention to the details. And Matthew's like, I'm taking them all out of there. Just make life difficult for you. Why would he do that? Why would he take away the details and make this seem so generic, so vague about where we are and who we're speaking to? Because the point is, he could be anywhere. Jesus could be in Jerusalem. He could be in Galilee. He could be in Papua New Guinea. He could be in McKinney, Texas. He would have said the same thing, and he would have felt the same thing. Same problem. Yemen or the United States, same problem. Lost is lost. The standard universal state of the world is shepherdless sheep with zero exceptions. We are all victims of the things we are guilty of. We are all lost in our sins. We suffer because we follow our own misguided desires. That is their problem back then and over there. It's our problem right here and right now. But that's not the main point Matthew's making. The point is seeing what that reality does in Jesus' heart. When Jesus, the the mighty Savior of the world, looks at these crowds, at people lost in their sin, what happens? Is it revulsion? Is it anger? Does he back away? He comes near and has compassion. He loves. Why? Because he's the shepherd. He's the shepherd they need. I was at McDonald's a few weeks ago with my two older kids giving my wife a break from our you know, newborn, or not from our newborn, with our newborn. He needs her. Um, but I was with my two older kids, and Charlie, my two-year-old, who is usually potty trained, uh, had an accident. And uh, how do I put this? It's the worst kind of accident, okay? The smellier, messier one. I hope I don't need to give you more information than that. Uh, And, you know, normally I'm, you know, with our newborn, I'm diaper dad, okay? I'm like a superhero, okay? Change diaper, amazing, super speed. But this was the big leagues, okay? This was, you know, a two-year-old and, uh, again, the the less desirable accident. Uh, I had to take him to the bathroom in McDonald's, and when he, you know, he finishes stuff on the potty, And I realized this McDonald's bathroom had no toilet paper to speak of. In any of the stalls, zero. So I leave him and my four-year-old in the stall. I go out and I say to the staff, there's no toilet paper in there. Could you please get us some toilet paper? Um, And this is, you know, 
Again, a gross situation. I don't know if I've made that clear. It was disgusting. <laughs> and about five minutes go by with me just waiting in the bathroom with a poop-covered two-year-old. And they didn't bring the toilet paper. And so I went out again and I said, excuse me, there's no toilet paper in here. We could really use some. Uh, obviously, I should have brought the diaper bag, but I like to live dangerously. And here we are. And five more minutes go by and <laughs> Slady brings in a handful of toilet paper. She clearly had just ripped off the roll from the women's bathroom. And she said, this is all that there's left in the building, all the toilet paper. And I said, that's not going to be enough. Um, so we were ill-equipped. I realized that. And I had to put his pants back on, his not yet fully clean behind. Parents, I've been there. We're, I've been like you, okay? We've, we've all suffered in the same way. Kids, you have no idea what your parents do for you. Uh, and I had to take him home and give him a bath, which is also gross. I tell that story because the whole time, my heart, as gross as it was, my heart went out to my son. This was repulsive, but I love him. I can't help but feel compassion when he's clearly suffering. The McDonald's staff, not so much. Not very helpful, no compassion. But I'm his dad, and I can't help but feel compassion. E even in a gross situation like that, and it's true that our natural, reasonable reaction to gross things is revulsion. We back away, and make no mistake, there's nothing more repulsive in the world than sin. It destroys lives, it steals joy, it spits in the face of God. If anything should drive the holy Messiah away, it's this. And yet this is where Jesus comes near. It's where he has compassion because he's the shepherd. He's the Lord in Ezekiel 34, verse 8. This is what the Lord says. He says, as I live, declares the Lord God, surely my sheep have become a prey and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts. Since there was no shepherd, behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on the day of clouds and thick darkness, and I will bring them out from the peoples, gather them from the countries. I will bring them into their own land, and I will feed them. Brothers and sisters, friends, Christ's compassion for you comes long before any reason you could ever give him for it. Jesus' love does not come in response to anything you could give or any even just desire in your heart or work of your hands. It comes from who he is as the shepherd. And one day, the very compassion we see here in the heart of our Lord, will take him to the cross. Where he would look down on his lost sheep who had nailed him there. And he would still love them. He became the shepherd who was slaughtered like a lamb for his sheep. The Lord in Ezekiel 34 who says, I will feed them, I will call them, I will bring them in. That's who he was to the very bitter end. And so, brothers and sisters, there's, there's two questions I want you to ask yourself. In light of this, this beautiful picture we get of our Lord, this, this inner, inner glimpse of his emotional life. First, isn't he wonderful? I mean, isn't he amazing? Do you see the beauty of his heart for the lost? Do you marvel? Are you amazed that he could look at you and care and love before you even cared a bit, before any reason you could ever give him. He loved you. Are you amazed at his compassion? And if your answer is, is yes, here's the next question. 
Do you have that compassion for the lost? Do you look at the aimless craziness of a world without Jesus and get angry? Or do you feel pity? Do you long for them to know this shepherd too? Friends, brothers and sisters, the the Muslims in Yemen may be the political enemies of our nation. They're not your enemies. Nor is your liberal neighbor, nor is your co-worker who parrots the the self-centered mottos of our age. They are not your enemies worthy of your hatred. They're aimless sheep worthy of your compassion. They need a shepherd. I know, like, the Babylon Bee is really funny. I giggle at the headlines, too. I don't giggle. I laugh. I laugh at the headlines, too, because it's easy. It's easy and fun to mock the insanity of a world apart from Christ. It's easy. That's low-hanging fruit. But how, how hypocritical of us, how, how hateful if we scorn and mock those apart from Christ when that's who you were before you had this shepherd. That's who you are today without this shepherd. You were lost. You were wandering. You were a victim of the very things you were guilty of. You were suffering because of the very things you valued. And your shepherd came. He called He put his arms around you. He picked you up. He carried you home and he promised to be your shepherd forever. The world is lost and aimless and it needs that shepherd. But then there's a really important question. What do we do? What do we do now? If that's the state of the world and they need this shepherd, what do we do? We know the solution, but there's a wide world of people out there who don't, who need it, who need this shepherd. And that's where Jesus takes us next, verses 37 through 38. Then he, Jesus, said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So what's going on here, Jesus switches metaphors, right? He goes from the shepherding sheep agricultural, sorry, he switches to an agricultural metaphor, from the shepherding sheep metaphor to the agricultural metaphor, the one of the the harvest. Uh, And when he uses the word harvest, what he's talking about here is actually uh, something that we see uh, across the Old Testament in a couple of specific passages, uh, but that we actually, I think, get the clearest explanation of the metaphor at the end of the New Testament in Revelation chapter 14. So let's look there. John writes in Revelation 14, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. And then I looked, and behold, this is a few verses later, behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head, and here's where the harvesting metaphor comes in, and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap. For the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So we see two things here. We see the gospel going out, being proclaimed to all the peoples and nations of the world. And we see the harvest is what happens afterwards. It is the ingathering, the bringing in of all the peoples of the earth from all across the the world. And this happens at the end of time, when the time is fulfilled. It is this eschatological end times bringing in of the people of God. That's the harvest. And the work of that gospel going out, and the work that Jesus is talking about here in Matthew 9, so we often refer to as world missions. World missions. Christians, we have our own lingo about a lot of different things. That's the Christianese term for it, world missions. Now remember, 
Matthew's being deliberately vague. He's being deliberately generic about where this is going so that we know this is true of the whole world. This is every tribe, people, and nation. They are all shepherdless sheep, and they need the shepherd who, who they meet in the gospel, the gospel of Christ's life, death, and resurrection for us. That's who they need. And so Jesus has a plan to get this gospel out, to harvest the people of God from across the world. And uh, his plan is pretty epic. Are you ready? This is, this is Jesus' amazing, epic, unbelievable plan to get the gospel from, ev- from one little place to everywhere in the entire world. What is the plan? Pray. Pray. Now, if you're like me, that's kind of a letdown. It's like, okay, cool, pray. Did that. Now what do I do? Give me something. I got to do something, right? I mean, Jesus, there's 8 billion people out there, vast portions of them utterly lost in their sin. Your solution is pray? Like, whisper a few words? That's that's what we're going to do? Surely we can come up with a better plan than that. Well, no, we can't. And my desire for all of you, Parkway Church, is that you would grasp the mind-blowing work Jesus calls us to when he says, pray. Pray. And that you would, in response, in obedience, pray. So to help you do that, I have seven reasons why Jesus says pray. Some of you were thinking, this is great. You know, it's only 1119. We're going to get our Super Bowl shopping done early because church is going to be short. We're on the last verse of the passage. Sorry, Jesus has better plans. Seven reasons why to accomplish the task of world missions the first thing Jesus says is pray. Reason number one, because world missions is God's work before it's our work. World missions is God's work before it's our work. If you were here last uh, Sunday for our theological equipping class, the hour before the service, uh, I taught on the theme of mission across the whole Bible. And one of the things I pointed out is you see it everywhere. God is the one who initiates who completes, who fulfills mission from start to finish. He, the whole thing is God. It is his mission, his work that he's doing. Sure, yes, in like 20 years, we're going to get to Matthew 28 in this sermon series. And Jesus is going to give us the great commission, right? We have a role to play. Go make disciples of all nations. That's coming. Don't worry. We're not passive. But before he says go in Matthew 28, Jesus says, all authority is mine. In other words, this is my work. I'm commissioning you. I'm deputizing you to be a part of what I'm doing in the world. Missions is God's work before it's our work. It is his authority on which we do the work. And notice what God is called here in this passage in Matthew 9. Who is he? He's the Lord of the harvest. Jesus says he's the Lord of the harvest. At the very end of the verse, it says he's, it's his harvest. It's not our harvest. This is God's harvest. He's the Lord of the harvest, so pray. That's reason number one. Reason number two. Why to accomplish the task of world missions, Jesus says pray, because the world's primary problem is vertical and spiritual. Our primary problem is vertical and spiritual. The plight of the world is vertical and spiritual before it is horizontal and physical. Everyone in the world, without exception, has an opinion about what's wrong with the world. Everyone has an opinion. If if you think it's ignorance, the solution is education. If you think pollution is the problem, then, you know, electric cars. If you think it's sickness and disease, the solution is health care. If it's war, we need to advocate for peace. Whatever the problem is determines the solution. And those are all problems. We should care about those things. But they are all symptoms, not the disease. They are all fruits and not the root. Our fundamental problem is not horizontal or physical. Our fundamental problem is this, Romans chapter 3. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. 
No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouths are full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Imagine you're on the Titanic and it's going down. We hit the iceberg. We're going down. Is your priority task putting together a seminar on communication and marriage. You're on the Titanic and it's going down. Is your priority task a, uh, a lesson on basic hygiene to, avoid, to help people avoid getting sick? Is your priority task a PowerPoint on how to recycle plastic waste so it doesn't end up in the ocean? No, because you're about to end up in the ocean. There's this thing in the emergency room uh, called triage. Right? So when you, when you get to the emergency room, they triage you. So that means they determine how serious, how urgent, how immediate the problem is. So the guy with a gunshot wound gets in before the kid with the sniffles. Makes sense. This is why 1 Corinthians 15 says the gospel is of first importance. If the fundamental problem of the world is that they are people who are lost, who are shepherdless sheep, then the priority solution is introducing them to the shepherd. It's the most pressing need. Triage dictates that's where you focus. Their beef is with God, so it is God to whom they must be reconciled, so it is God to whom we must pray. That's reason number two. Reason three. Because God loves the people of the world more than we ever could. God loves the people of the world more than we ever could. I hope you see that just flowing from this passage. Like when Jesus sees the crowd and his heart is filled with compassion, when he, when he looks at the godless men and women of Yemen, his heart floods with love. When he sees your neighbor believing the lies of our age, he pities them. We, 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 on the other hand, need to be reminded to love the world. I had to say it in a sermon, love your neighbor, right? We have to say these kind of things because we, by nature, do not love those who are naturally unlovable, who are difficult to love. It's not our natural reaction. We see sin and foolishness. <laughs> but God needs no such reminders. Compassion for the lost is his nature because of who he is. My wife is a doctor, a family medicine doctor. And when one of my kids is sick, I don't go to WebMD. I go to her. I'm talking to her first, prioritizing her opinion, her diagnosis, her prescription. My wife doesn't write prescriptions for my kids. Don't, don't hear that part. Um, that would be wrong. That would be very, very wrong. But you get the point, right? I trust her most when it comes to the health and well-being of my kids because she loves them the most. There's no doctor in the world who loves my kids more than my wife does. It's her nature as their mom. And as mankind's creator, as the one in whose image every single human being is made, God loves the shepherdless crowds. He's the shepherd they need, so he's the one we come to for the solution. So pray. Reason four. Why does Jesus say pray? Because it is more important that God raise up the right people for world missions than that we raise up a lot of people for it. It's more important God raises up the right people than that we raise up a lot of people. Here we get to what Jesus actually tells us to pray for. So his command is pray, but he specifically tells us what to pray for. He says, pray to the Lord of the harvest so that he sends out laborers into his harvest. He doesn't say the laborers are few. Get everyone together. Send out as many people as you can. We need people. He says, pray for God to send them. I think, unfortunately, this is one of the biggest mistakes 
the American church makes in regards to world missions. I'm not just talking about churches outside our kind of tribe, our, you know, Reformed, Baptist, Evangelical tribe. Uh, This spans denominations. The mistake is we think as long as we're sending people, we're fulfilling the Great Commission. Like what God needs overseas is warm bodies. That's what he needs. I've hung around a lot of, uh, you know, kind of missions types, and you almost never hear in the kind of missions community, a challenge to someone's desire to be a missionary. Now, historically, there was, for for sending out missionaries, there was a a very rigorous assessment and ordination and commissioning process. But today, this is what the test looks like. Someone says, I want to be a missionary, and we do this. We got a live one. That's a pulse. Go for it. We have in-depth processes, extensive vetting for who we might let stand at our pulpits or serve as a a pastor, an elder, or as a deacon. But far too often, all you need to be a missionary is a pulse. And the nations suffer because of it. Let me read you an, an article from a missionary pastor in the Middle East. This is someone on the front lines of missions right now, and this is what he wrote. He says, a lot of people are going to the nations who, frankly, shouldn't be going, at least not yet. Why does it seem that passion rather than proven faithfulness is the main criterion for sending men and women to support church plants? Why on earth is the bar set lower for the front lines than it is for the local church? The challenges of frontier ministry, its stresses and temptations are very real, and time and again, people are sent to face those challenges who have much zeal but lack understanding. The field that is white for harvest is being filled with laborers who destroy the crop. Those who misuse or disuse the tools God has given them. Imagine a field full of people swinging a scythe in the wrong direction and sometimes from the wrong end. And too often, if I dare drag out the metaphor a bit further, they're not using the scythe at all. Their hands are empty. Not a pretty picture. If you want that full article, email me. I can send it to you. This is a problem. We've done a poor job, especially in America, deciding for ourselves who should go. We need to pray so that God raises up those who should go. Which leads us to the next reason, reason number five. Because only God can author the miracle of the missionary call. Jesus says, pray to the Lord of the harvest because only God can author the miracle of the missionary call call. Missions makes no earthly sense. It doesn't make sense. To to trade a life of comfort and ease in your home country for one of hardship and difficulty and uncertainty somewhere else, the missionary call takes a miracle. And yet, it is a miracle that God loves to work. 1979, a man named Ted Fletcher left behind his cushy corporate job, steady paycheck, to found a missions agency now called Pioneers, and it is the second biggest missions agency in the entire world. It made no earthly sense. Why would you do that? Why would you leave what was comfortable for that? But God did it. In 1858, a man named John Patton Uh, was planning to leave Scotland, his his native land, to go and preach the gospel among cannibalistic tribes on an island in the Pacific. And in his own church, his own church members pushed back on it. They told him he shouldn't go. They couldn't understand why he would go preach the gospel to cannibals far away. And one man, his name, uh, unfortunately for him, has been immortalized forever. One man in Patton's biography, Mr. Dixon, came up to John Patton And said, the cannibals, you will be eaten by cannibals. And this is how John Patton responded. Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave. They are to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I am eaten by cannibals or by worms. And in the great day, my resurrection body will rise as fair as yours. 
in the likeness of our Redeemer. That kind of mindset, that kind of apprehension of a supernatural reality takes a miracle. And God gave that miracle. Many of you probably know the story of Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. Missionaries to tribes in the Amazon. Jim was speared to death by the very people he was trying to share the love of Jesus with. And what did his wife Elizabeth do in response? What did she do when she saw the evil wickedness of the world? In her own words, plans were promptly formulated for continuing the work of the martyrs. She went back to the tribe, to the very men who had killed her husband, and she shared the gospel with them. And three years later, this is what she wrote. Today I sit in a tiny leaf-thatched hut on the Tuanu River in another leaf house about 10 feet away sit two of the seven men who killed my husband. How did this come to be? Only God who made iron swim, who caused the sun to stand still, and whose hand is the breath of every living thing. Only this God, who is our God forever and ever, could have done it. It made no earthly sense for Elizabeth Elliot to go back to those tribes that had killed her husband, just as it made no earthly sense for the cannibals, for the, the, the people to believe this gospel of a crucified Savior. And yet, God gave that miracle. These are the miracles God loves to work. So pray. Which leads us to reason number six. Jesus says, pray to accomplish the task of world missions because world missions needs the power of God more than the strategies of men. It needs the power of God. Another thing you find in the missions community today is a lot of strategies. A lot of strategies. How, you know, Ten steps to lead a Muslim to faith in Christ through a Bible study. Right? Uh, strategies are fine. Strategies aren't bad. Nothing wrong with strategies unless it's the strategies in which we place our trust. Jesus doesn't say, the laborers are few, find a technique to ensure rapid growth, or get the most dynamic speakers, or make church as cool as you can so they come. He says, pray, because it is God who makes stone hearts flesh. It is God who makes blind eyes see. We can try to manufacture responses all day long, but none of the fruit will last if it doesn't come from God's hands. Sometimes we act like the, the parable of the soils, right? Like, we, like the, the point is we need to find the right soil. That's not the point at all. The point is we scatter the seed and God gives the growth. We plant the gospel and God does it. If you read church history, you see this again and again. Anytime, like in the second great awakening, anytime uh, our, our, our attempt to manufacture a movement gets in the way of our reliance on the power of God, the fruit is bad. Anytime we put faith in man's strategies for conversion, it will not bear fruit because it is the power of God that the nations need and he will answer our prayers, so pray. Reason number seven, why Jesus says pray to accomplish the task of world missions because God will get the glory for world missions. God will get the glory. This follows from absolutely everything we've just said. It's the logical result. It's God's harvest. It's his work, his mission, his call to the missionary, his power that saves. So the glory is his. If Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, do what you can, we get the glory. But if the very basis of the missionary enterprise is prayer, all the glory is God. Romans 11.36, for from him and through him and to him are all things, including missions. To him be glory forever. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, what do we do? We pray. 
Jesus, Jesus says in Matthew 28, the great commission passage, the famous mission passage, go make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. This is one of those commands. This is one of the things Jesus commands us to teach other, each other to obey. Pray and let this blow your mind. Jesus himself will answer the very prayers he commands us to pray. How cool is that? The one who says, pray to the Lord of the harvest, by the way, I'm the Lord of the harvest, sends out workers. He's the one who will go to the cross to call his sheep home. He's the one who says, go make disciples of all missions. He is the one who right now, every day, is sending out missionaries, evangelists, and pastors, and Christians around the world because the fields are white for the harvest and the laborers are few. He is answering our prayers. One month from today, I have friends going to Albania because God loves to answer the prayers he commands us to pray. So with that, let's pray. God, you are the one we need. And all this, to be able to love our neighbors, to be able to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, to see the nations one for the cause of Christ, you are the one we need. So we pray, God, we pray you would raise up laborers for your harvest. Father, you, we pray that you would keep us from living in complacency and ease to count the cost of following Jesus and see it is worth it no matter where we could live, no matter what we could do, no matter what he might call us to, he is worthy. So God, raise up laborers, even from this room, raise up laborers for your harvest. Stir in hearts uh, a desire that makes no earthly sense to go and bring your gospel to the peoples of the earth. Raise up laborers for your harvest, we pray. Amen.